Okay, there was uh, obviously meant to be a, a slightly different presentation. I'm going to come at it from my bias. I won't apologize for that. Um, I hope I'm going to be able to provide you with some resources, although I'm going to show you the English version. Both of these books have been published in multiple languages. There's also a video, a documentary that um, may well be in other languages, but I don't know, but it's highly visual. Um, so it's, uh, I think it transcends language, and you'll see that. I'll show a clip of that at the end, okay, for you? So um, uh, I've actually embedded within the presentation the name of the books and the author. So when you get the presentation, you'll see it within that anyway, but it's very quick for you to write it down if you wanted to do that right now, okay? So I'm going to come at from uh, two aspects on leadership from my standpoint. Um, I am going to use the dashboard concept again because you as leaders, you can't focus on absolutely every minute detail. Some people are a little bit more focused towards the, the small stuff and others are a little bit more focused on the grand scheme. But as a leader, I think you have to have the trust in your team to give people responsibility and ask them to look after specific, specific areas. So I'm going to keep coming at you with that idea of what's on your dashboard of leadership? What are you directly responsible for? And what are you going to use other people for? Again, my role this morning is just to throw the rock in the pond, cause some ripples, make you think you don't have to agree with everything I say. That's not the point of this. And as a leader, you're going to have to deal with both sort of constructive elements within your culture as well as destructive things. And when it comes to conflict in particular, there can be constructive conflict and destructive conflict. Nothing wrong with constructive conflict if it's helping to move your organization or your team forward. It's destructive stuff that actually detracts from that process that's the problem. And you as the leader, you as the coach, you as the mentor, you need to learn how to handle that type of aspect. And one of the key aspects is not to allow yourself to become threatened by anything. You've got to rise above that. And that comes back to your own personal values and beliefs. And you'll see in both authors, they talk very conclusively about that aspect, your values and beliefs as your cornerstone. We heard lots of examples yesterday where each one of you are constantly being challenged by people or groups that don't hold the same values to you. Particularly those of you dealing with children, for example, where people are trying to do things with children and youth, which we know are not right. The point at which you compromise starts to undermine you. And I can assure you, in terms of your own integrity, as you compromise back from what you truly believe in, you will not be a great coach. You will not be a great person. And you certainly won't be a great leader every time you compromise, if it's something that actually erodes your underlying beliefs and values. It makes you less of a person. So stand up to bullies. So I'm going to talk a bit about culture. I'm going to certainly talk, obviously, about the construct of leadership within the culture that you create, that environment. We're going to talk about uh, a book by Alan Willett. Okay. Leading the Unleadable is the name of his particular book. We're going to talk a little bit by the very first book I get any high performance director, any coach that I work with over the last four or five Olympic cycles to read, and that's the book simply called Leadership by Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York City. Okay, it was written back in 2005. It's in paperback, multiple languages, CDs, tapes, you name it. Okay, very, very solid book. You don't have to agree with his politics, but how he ran New York City is a lesson for all of us. And then obviously interspersed within all of this are my own personal comments, both from time within the Royal Marines and 5 SBS of the Special Forces Group, which is my own background, through to um, dealing with the high-performance sports groups that I deal with in Canada. So performance culture, don't get too frightened about the word performance. We always think performance, maybe talking about some kind of um, national team program. I'm talking about your performance. Are you most efficient, most effective? That's performance. Are you the best parent you could be? So the performance of being a parent. Are you the best 
administrator at work? Are you the best coach that you could possibly be? So that's what I mean by performance. And the interesting thing about performance culture is all domains, okay, so business, sport, charities, no matter what, if you look at all of them, less than 10% of the world's organizations achieve sustainable success. Less than 10%. And the main reason is they don't really attend to what are the basics. They don't think about the dashboard. But the 10% that do achieve it, and you can think of what those organizations that might be, the ones that stand the test of time, that, that are true dis dynasties, they all have unique elements to them. But at the same time, they all are quite similar to each other. So you could compare, say, Barcelona football, FC Barcelona, with perhaps IBM. And there will be common characteristics, and yet very clearly unique. So they have very unique environments and atmospheres. So Google looks very different, believe it or not, say to, I don't know, who could we choose? Virgin Atlantic Airlines, okay? Both sustainable, successful organizations. But they have very, very similar values and beliefs. This is why if you are successful, you don't have to worry about being copied. People get very sort of insular and they're very protective. And that's usually the first sign of something started to go wrong. Because you cannot be copied. You're unique. This gentleman is unique. If he creates a culture based on what his values and beliefs are within his group, we can't copy. We can learn about what he does and what his processes are, but we cannot be him. You can know what, you know, Manchester United cannot be FC Barcelona. They can be Manchester United and behave in a similar way to Barcelona, put in you know, a very, very good academy. They have very, very good policies. They have health care and, and they have great coaching. They can have the same sort of policies and procedures, but they can't be FC Barcelona. Barcelona has the fabric of that Catalonian spirit. It's in Barcelona, the city. All the traits of that particular culture are embedded within it. So that's what makes it unique. Same for any of these organizations, their essence. So don't worry about being copied. You've got to think about what actually are you? What do you stand for? So you want to create a great coaching club in, in the sport of hockey? But it starts with you. Your essence. And can you bring along a wave of people who are like-minded, who have that similar belief. And you establish the behaviors and processes around that. So these aspects are the things you need to think about. You're unique, so what does that look like? What does it mean? That's some of the intangible things that's part of being life, being a person. And then what are the underscoring values and beliefs? And you better communicate those very clearly to everyone, right from the get-go. Tom Watson, not the golfer, but the founder of IBM, said this about truly great organizations. One, they have a very, very clear vision of what the future looks like. Okay, very clear vision, bang. Two, they have a very clear understanding of what, how and what that vision behaves like. So here's the vision, this is how it behaves. And then number three, the real trick, the difficult thing is, long before that organization becomes that vision, you start behaving like it. And that's the trick, because everyone will procrastinate. Everyone will say, why well, we can't do things. No one actually pulls the trigger and starts to do things, because you're always waiting for conditions typically to be perfect. But if you keep waiting, you will never reach that point. That's why the greatest entrepreneurs in the, in the world, they often fail, but they fail en route eventually to some success because they keep doing, doing, doing. So if you really want to be a leader, you've got to do based on your values and beliefs. And here's the interesting thing. We are called human beings, and I've just said we need to do some things. And there's a, there's a tightrope tight that you have to walk between simply being a human doing and just going through the motions and being a human being 
being in the moment, being true to yourself, and doing these things. Okay? So don't simply be a human doer that just sort of goes through an emotion. Live within yourself. And these statements really mean that. It's just like coaching. There's an art to it as well as the science. And we lose sight of the art at times. So, the interesting thing, those organizations that achieve that successful, sustainable behaviors, they have core areas. The one we're going to focus on this morning, leadership. They all have very, very clear ways of communicating, and everyone understands how that happens. They have very, very strident actions, and they act with a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency. Time is ticking. You know, it's interesting, a few years ago, actually two years ago, Health Canada said that the average life expectancy for a Canadian male was 80 years, and for a female, 82. So that's about 29,000 days in change for the males and about 31,000 days for the females. Okay? So that's true. I've only got about, I don't know, 8,500 days left. So I can choose to procrastinate not do anything for the next six months. So there's a hundred and odd days thrown down the drain straight away. And it's not true that I have 8,500 days because I'll be asleep for about well over 2,000 of them. I'll be sitting on the toilet for 150 of them. Thank God that's quality time, of course. Get my thinking done. But what I'm trying to say to you is these successful groups led by great leaders, act with a sense of urgency. Okay? We talked a lot yesterday, a whole theme, thematic day on long-term athlete development. You know, when I first got on that kick of really trying to influence people to think about what to do for children, that was over 20, 25 years ago. So that five-year-old kid, when I first started opening my mouth on that particular subject, is now 30 years of age, did nothing for that kid. That's what I lose sleep over. Didn't impact all those kids that we've been talking about, twiddling our thumbs while we can't get our thumbs out of our asses on long-term athlete development. We're doing nothing for that generation. That's why you need to act with a sense of urgency, because time flies very quickly. And analytics. Flashy word meaning what metrics? What are, key what are you measuring? You can measure lots of stuff, but are you measuring the right things to know that your performance marble is moving forward? You know, we, again, I'll come back to that theme on athlete development. You know what the most important metric for me is in dealing with children in sport? Is the retention level each year. If you started off with 100 kids signing up for hockey at age five, do you have those same 100 kids at 18 years of age when they leave high school? Do they come back year after year after year of their own volition, not simply because they're being bullied by their parents? So what are the true metrics for you when you start to look at building a good, strong leadership team? They all have six behaviors, and depending on the authors, you can find 12 or 10, but over the years, I've just gradually synthesized down to my dashboard. And there are other authors that talk about these particular six. So I look for good teams to have clearly high aspirations, high goals, high standards, high expectations that they communicate to the world, because that keeps you honest. If you turn around and you say, you know what, we're going to do that in the next two years, bang, and you tell everyone. That'll keep you very honest, because you're going to have all those armchair critics out there that are going to hold you to what you just said. You don't sort of whisper it to yourself, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to win an Olympic medal. And you just tell a few friends. No, you say, we're going to win an Olympic medal. That will keep you honest. And the best organizations communicate those aspirations clearly. They all have an external focus. And what I mean by that is this. They are all focused on their direct client. So you, who really is your client? Now, if you're dealing with young children, your children, the players, really are your client as a coach. But you're having to go through the intermediary, of course, of parents. 
But sooner or later, as those kids grow and become more self-actualized, they become your direct client. So great organizations are always focused on their customer or client. You've just got to sort out who that is. And at different levels, you may have different clients. You might have a client might be the supplier of equipment. The client might be the supplier of the facility. Okay, in a certain way. So there are different, different levels of these relationships. You should always be focused on your customers and your competition. What they are not is internally focused. Organizations that degenerate into gossip or the nonsense of life or the noise. You know what I'm talking about. How much time do you spend on the crap Often it's not because you haven't lived some of the other values, you haven't communicated effectively. So someone has got a mixed message or they didn't understand the message and now their feelings are hurt. So now you've got all the gossip going on with that. Oh, my feelings are hurt. So because you failed in one area, it starts to affect other areas. Ownership, that just means accountability. Does everyone understand in the entire system their role and responsibility? Was that clearly understood? Are they then going to take responsibility, take ownership for that particular role that you have given them? Again, comes down a lot to communication. If you haven't communicated exactly what that role and responsibility is, they're going to be confused, you're going to be confused, they're going to do a job that you don't think they should be doing, they're doing a job they think they should be doing, but it's not really the job they should be doing in the first place. And then that leads to conflict, it leads to gossip, it leads to an internal focus, it leads to nonsense. And it leads to deviation from the path to be effective and efficient. Action. Mentioned just previously, all these organizations are action-oriented. This is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it on this timeline, and this is how we're going to be measured. And we do it with a sense of urgency. The faster, the more accurate we can get it done, the more efficient and effective we'll be, and we can get on to do other stuff and keep moving that marble forward. They all have passion. If I came and visited you, and I walk into the rink or the building that, where your office is, I should get goosebumps as I walk down the hallways of your offices. What's on the walls should scream at me that there's a passion for hockey in this room, in this building. There should be a, a buzz, there should be a vibe. You should be a vibrant organization. Even on a, after a long week on a Friday afternoon, there's still that vibe. But I took you to Google. There's a, there's a lifeblood to the place. It almost breathes, the building almost breathes because of people who are there, despite the fact that they work very hard. They have a passion to be there. They're not simply there for the paycheck. And the other thing is clearly, to achieve that type of vibe, you need people that truly believe in the team. Giuliani has a particular chapter we're gonna talk about later that really brings that alive. You need people that team, therefore they need to believe, they need to have the same values and beliefs as you, so that they are on the team and they're not just saying that. They're not gonna jump ship when the best next offer turns up. So again, this dashboard. You could, we could have chosen thousands of other particular areas to look at, but I chose some very specific ones for you to think about. That's my bias. So let's look at what other people said. So here's Leading the Unleadable by Alan Willett. Okay? Now he's definitely identified as a major guru in, in sort of leadership ergonomics, if you like. This is Alan. And he says very conclusively, right at the start of any of his talks and books, that leadership is a choice. You choose to be a leader and you choose to be the type of leader that you were going to be. And remember, there's all different types of leadership. You've got many examples of leadership in hockey who are very good people and you know they're only going to last one season. 
because they're not going to be a sustainable type coach. They're the type of guy you bring in for the season, sort out some of the driftwood, get, some of the, get rid of some of the nonsense, but they're not going to survive. They implode, or maybe it's two or three seasons, compared to those that stand the test of time and truly understand what it means. So there's two things, choosing to be a leader and choosing to be the type of leader that you want to be. We heard a lot yesterday. Tom Rennie talked about being the type of leader who stands in front of everyone and his team when things are going wrong and shields the team, and when things are going well, stands behind the team and allows them, based on their roles and responsibilities, to take the accolades. That's a hallmark of great leadership. So what are the other types of things he says? Well, first off, leadership, you should understand, is not simply making a bunch of decisions every day. We've got a president of the United States who's existing currently just by making executive orders. whoop de whoop That doesn't really tell you anything about the underlying systems. What's happening truly to the policies and procedures? Not one policy has come out yet in the first 100 days. But lots of executive orders. So it's not simply making decisions. You have to understand that as a leader, you will have to deal more often than not with lots of crap stuff. I once saw a TED talk where a person described using just his hands. This is the amount of good information I have to give every day or every week to my leadership executive, the people he reports to, his board of directors, his shareholders. Okay? And here's all the bad information I have to give them every single day. So you must understand that you're going to have to deal, if you want to be a leader, you're going to have to deal with a lot of negativity. And you're going to have to be able to go home at night and go to sleep. So what you must do is embrace all the positives. As a leader, you have the opportunity to help people, to mentor people to allow other people to blossom. That's a fundamental thing, so embrace that. You have the ability to make positive change, however small it is. You have the ability to move an organization forward. You have an ability to affect children and, and youth's lives. You have an ability to affect a player's career. But you can do these from a positive action. You need to really embrace that. And despite the fact you're in sports that are measured by win-losses, what are the positives that you can really go after? Because there's going to be lots of negatives. Remember that word performance. There's only one place at the top of an Olympic podium. Only three places on the podium as a whole. There's only one place that's going to win the league. You've got 20 teams in the league, 19 are going to be disappointed every season, every season. So the odds of success are not with you. Not if you're honest. You have to get rid of the nonsense, as I said, and that's tough because we get embroiled. That's human nature. But you must rise above that. You must cut that out. You must make it very clear in your values and beliefs as you communicate that, that you will not tolerate this stuff. Gossip has no place in your organization. Facts, sense of urgency, integrity. What is the energy equation? You can think about it. At the end of each week, in your organization, there will be both positive energy and negative energy. Positive energy, even if it's hard work, everyone is excited to take this challenge on. And there's a vibe to that. Not simply just the grind, but as soon as you start to get to a point where, my God, this is, this is just sapping all the energy out of me, then you're in trouble. So a little metric <laughs> for you as a leader is, what is your energy equation? Positive, negative. What are the things that are sucking the lifeblood out of you? And what are the things that are really getting you out of bed each day and getting you to bounce down to the office? And we're going to make a difference again from a positive aspect. And it's going to be tough, and it's going to be ebbs and flows of that. But you've got to try and keep in the middle there and keep things moving along. The hallmark of great leadership. And what does Giuliani say? 
Well, I'm going to write down the chapter titles of this book, the chapter titles. It's almost like just, even if you look to the chapters, a checklist for performance in anything, anything. So, he makes this statement first before we get into those. There are many qualities that make a great leader, but having strong beliefs, being able to stick with them through popular and unpopular times is the most important characteristic of a great leader. But underscoring that, remember, are logical, sensible values and beliefs that you communicate very, very effectively. But you have to hold the course. You're not going to sort of deviate all the time because things maybe seem to be popular or unpopular. That's why you're a leader. You're keeping the ship on course. Lots of people will want to deviate from the pathway. I'm building a a new sport institute for a particular country in the Middle East. It's a bit of a copy of others around the world. And in the meantime, they don't have facilities. And they're used to not doing anything because they're waiting for the perfect scenario. They're waiting for their new building to be built. So in the meantime, they've got all these athletes not even bothering to train. They're paying them, but because they don't, they're not prepared to put a temporary facility up. So I walked in and I said, there's an old warehouse across the road. Who does it belong to? Oh, it actually belongs to one of our board members. Okay, go to that board member and say, you want to borrow that building, it's empty, for the next six months while we build the first bit of the True Institute, gut this thing out, put some special flooring down, put some equipment in and get your athletes chaining right there. We could do that within two weeks. So I left it. It was the number one thing. So I left the country about, uh, I don't know, this was about four weeks ago. I was only there for about five days. And I said, that's the number one thing that I want you to get done. So I get an email when I arrived here saying they wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. So why am I telling you that story? I'm saying we all agreed, we all know that that is the actual way we should be going, okay? But because this board member's having a bit of a tiff with someone else on the board, it became political and it became personal, they talked themselves out of making the right decision. So meanwhile, the athletes, no sense of urgency, they're not going to train, and they talk them into a pathway that isn't this one. And why is that? Because they haven't got any leadership. No one's prepared to stand up to the plate and say, this is what we're doing. Okay? And they're waiting for the perfect situation of one day having a building. And you know what? They get that perfect building and they're still going to make sh- shitty decisions because they didn't get to the underlying stuff that says, no nonsense. This is what we believe in. This is what we're going to do. And you see it all the time. That's why I said less than 10% of organizations worldwide are performance organizations because you talk themselves out of it all the time, deviate. Poor communication, don't hold to the value system, don't hold on task, a leadership that is wavering rather than unwavering. Okay, chapter one in Rudy Giuliani's book is first things first. So in other words, before you start rushing, have you done your environmental scan? Have you done your little SWOT analysis? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Do you understand what's going on? Do you, do you really get to understand the lay of the land before you leap in? Okay? Don't confuse that with the comment I made earlier about not acting with urgency. You've just got to gather this information and if you're a true student of the area that you're in or a true student of hockey, you should have a lot of information at your fingertips straight away. No one should know your organization better than you do. So right now, you could probably cover a couple of sides of paper immediately with the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of your organization. So first things first, write it down. Chapter two, prepare relentlessly. Based on this information, understanding what your vision is, because you've clearly established what that is. What is that gap? And how are you going to prepare to gradually move from here to there? Understanding, of course, that what you need to do is prepare backwards from that vision and execute forwards. I'll come back to that point. Third one, straight away, 
laying the stage for behavior, everyone's accountable all of the time. Everyone is accountable all the time. Are you with me? You're on the bus, because we're heading here. This is the behavior set. Don't want to behave like this, gone. But, or do you compromise? You let a talented player get away with behaviors that you would not tolerate from anyone else on the team. See it all the time. Oh, we can't, he's our best player. So you've just immediately undervalued everything you believe in. So good luck trying to be a sustainable high performance coach under those circumstances. Ain't gonna happen. But no one has the guts to deal with those type of people. Or you deal with an administrator who's an asshole. And you tolerate that stuff. <laughs> Why? We just talked about an unwavering view. Values and beliefs underscoring everything. Everything that you allow to interfere with that undermines that. And one day, it will come back to haunt you. Surround yourself with great people. That's what I do with grad students. I find people that are far more intelligent with me. I've got better ideas at times. I say, go do this. They do some amazing work, and it makes me look good. The only key thing along that, because we've all got egos, nothing wrong with egos, is to make sure that in the same vein as everyone's accountable all the time, when they do good work, you are the first, you are the first to acknowledge that publicly. Reflect, then decide. This is a bit... Uh, in the Marines, we were always told this. Breathe, think, breathe, act. Same as this. So in other words, even in a very, very tenuous situation, you're going to storm into a building, run inside, you've got no idea what's going on, but before you do that, you've established in your mind, with a sense of urgency, because you can't hang around outside the building for 30 minutes, breathe, think, breathe, then act. So reflect, then decide. What pieces of information do you really need to make a decision? Because you have to make a decision. You're the leader. And you can't wait around for a year to make the decision because you've got to act with a sense of urgency. And unless you do, you may lose your clients or worse still, the competition comes past you. So reflect, then decide. Another reason for being a true student of your sport or organization because you've got to have the imp important information at hand to help you make that decision. And if you don't have that information, how do you make the decision? Under-promise and over-deliver, particularly with your team. Always surprise them. Wow, did you see what coach did for me? Never expected that. Thought we were going to get this. He went the extra mile. What kind of message do you think that sends? This is an organization that will always then go the extra mile. That doesn't mean to say you have low standards, because they said you have high standards. But you outperform them. Always. Always. Develop and communicate strong beliefs. We've heard that all the way through the morning so far. Develop and communicate strong beliefs. Does everyone understand this? Everyone on the same bus as me? Goes on, be your own man or woman. Be your own man or woman. You want to be a leader? No, no point being the clone of someone else. It's interesting that the great dynasties in corporate world and the sport world, they continue despite the change of personnel, despite the change of manager at a football club, despite the change, the best ones, because the values, the bedrock is always the same. The policies and the procedures of how they behave are the same. Doesn't matter what the personality ultimately is, because people still believe in the essence, which is greater than any one individual person. Oh, sorry, come back to this one. Loyalty, the vital virtue. This is the one thing that gets me upset how little loyalty there is at times in the world. How little loyalty there is. You want to build a team? You build a team where there is great loyalty inbred, that people understand integrity and what human behavior really is when you value the person next to you. 
become known for that. There's nothing wrong about caring for people and building a team where they care about each other. And they value that. And as we go down this list, there's another aspect that's going to come up. This one, in green, I do a bit tongue-in-cheek. Weddings discretionary, funerals mandatory. And when you read this chapter in the book, what he, Rudy Giuliani was saying was that whenever there was a wedding of someone who worked for the city of New York, or... Uh, a relation of someone that worked for the city of New York or a supplier to the city or a benefactor of the city, he would make it discretionary whether the city of New York sent an official representative to the wedding. But for funerals, absolutely mandatory. And the rationale was this, everything we've talked about. Weddings are easy. They're easy to do. They're joyous occasions. There's the happy couple, there's the future. You know, there's the ceremony, there's uh, going to be probably some dancing and alcohol and bridesmaids and all those type of things, okay? The funerals are hard work. Just the conversations alone take effort, real effort. These are the hard things in life. So you think of this. We all on a continuum, have we on any task, have weddings and funerals. Some of you will love administration, so that's a wedding for you. Okay? <laughs> Others of you in the room will hate doing administration. That's a funeral. So one of the beauties about building a very good, sustainable team is to make sure that you're all a bunch of weddings and have no funerals. Because whatever are his funerals are my weddings. And whatever are your weddings might be my funerals and you're making up for mine. As we bring the team together, whatever each person's deficiencies are, are picked up by someone else who has that as a capability of theirs. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Okay, weddings to scratch. Even, even athletes, think of this. The athlete training. Okay? Athletes will classically gravitate to the weddings of training. They love doing what they're already good at. They love doing what they like doing. They love doing what doesn't hurt. And they will shy away from the stuff over here, which is the stuff that they're not very good at, that hurts, that they don't like doing. And yet here, this area is the type of stuff that's really going to move their performance level forward. Performance on the outer limits is what will really push them, not what's already in their comfort zone. So this idea of weddings and, dis and funerals is on any domain. But what he's saying at times is the weddings are discretionary. You must get after the funerals. No negotiation on those. So what are the funerals of your organization? What are you neglecting? What are you shying away from? Because your competition isn't. Stand up to bullies. Lots of bullies. Parents are bullies. Some of the athletes are bullies. Agents are bullies. Sponsors are bullies. International federations can be bullies. You've got to stand up to them. Why? Because if you don't, what's being undermined? Your values and beliefs. Okay? And then you are less of a man or less of a woman because of it. And that'll come back to haunt you again. Well, we talked yesterday about uh, lifelong learning. Rudy Giuliani says it very clearly. Study, read, learn independently. What is your professional development aspect for you and your team? Do you take every Wednesday afternoon off and you bring in a book or a video, you show it to the group and you discuss it? It could be something completely unrelated to hockey. Okay? But you have to do that because that's how you're going to get better. And other times it may be a very technical thing for hockey. But you constantly, constantly move forward. Oh, damn. Organize around a purpose. So I'm going to show you a bit of video. Remember that aspect that Tom Watson said about the vision of the future? Okay. What does it look like? What's the purpose? Well, long before vision becomes purpose. Why do you exist? Why are you doing this? Why do you coach? Remember Tom right at the start yesterday? Why do you coach? Have you answered that question? Because that should give you your central purpose. And from that purpose, you would then be able to write down what you value and what you believe in. And then finally, this one, big one. Bribe only those that will stay bribed. 
If people are only with you for the paycheck, they don't truly believe in anything. They will jump ship for the next best opportunity always. And you want people that are going to th- ha- stay around through thick and thin with you. Okay, I did a, a, um, an exercise recently for a big law company in, uh, in Calgary. They're an international intellectual property group called Gowlings. And they had lost 25% of their technical staff when Calgary was going through a boom phase and lots of other law companies were coming in, okay, throwing money at the staff. So they were losing people who were just jumping for the next big salary. If you end up on that particular treadmill, the only card you can play is offering higher salaries. And that's the game you're going to lose in the end. Because you'll add more, and then the next group will add more, and so forth and so forth. What you have to do is offer something reasonably competitive, but you're going to lure them to work with you because they value what you're trying to do. They want to belong to something that is meaningful and has purpose. So what is that? And are you communicating it? So that's what Giuliani says. It's a great read. You have to understand this. It starts with leadership. You establish what the purpose is. And then underlying that, performance comes. What are the metrics? What are the behaviors? And it's as simple as that. You as a leader, establish the environment. What's the purpose? Away we go. You need to be ingenious. So you've got to have a high level of ingenuity. Okay, that's better the word than innovative. It's much more malleable and organic. You've got to have perseverance. You've got to be like a real terrier. You've got to be adaptable. You don't know what's coming at you next, and you must have resilience. You've got to be able to roll with the punches. Here's uh, Som Safe. Is an investment banker in, the United, in uh, Canada who completely revolutionized the way in which people will think about investing. If you listen, there are three things he says very clearly, and I want you to think about what is your elevator speech that you're going to say to parents, you're going to say to your benefactors, you're going to say to your team. Because in about 20 seconds, he's made it very clear why you should think about investing with his company. I even get goosebumps listening to what he says. It's in our name. It's what drives us. And it's our commitment to you. Hi, I'm Sam Safe. My goal has always been to make investing for Canadians better and cheaper. That's what Purpose is all about. We take a long-term perspective that combines low fees with a real focus on risk management. That's investing with Purpose. To learn more, speak with your advisor or visit PurposeInvest.com. One statement, you knew exactly what he was about. We take a long-term view, okay? We mitigate against risk, and away we go. You knew exactly what his company's about. No different than when Kennedy said, moon, when? End of decade. Pretty simple. Start of the 60s. Remember that speech? Remember when he said that? Said it to the Senate and everyone? What are we going to do? Going to the moon, we're going to take a man safely to the moon, sorry, to the moon and safely return him to the earth. And we're doing it by the end of the decade. That was long before they even had invented the Saturn V rocket. They didn't even understand the computer needs for it. And it was, they couldn't practice it before they did it for real. They could do some little simulations and dry runs, but they couldn't practice it before they did it the first time. That takes guts and a sense of urgency. What you need to have is a clear objective. You have to have defined expectations and established timelines. All good organizations have that. (coughs) Clear objectives, defined expectations, established timelines. So I'm having to rush here because I'm running out of time. You need to uh, know what you know. That might sound very stupid. Know what you know, know what you don't know, and know someone who does know. And I have a little rule, the three phone call rule. Okay, three phone call rule. If I can't find the answer within three phone calls, then I'm so far off the back of the bus in the first place that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Because my network of people within the first phone call, I should know that person, and he or she should be able to answer it for me if I didn't already know. And if I have to go to a second phone call, it's because of his or her network that extends everything out for me, right? So that aspect. So your networking is very important, but it also belies the fact that you need to know what the hell you're doing in the first place. 
going to finish up here. Signature processes. Well, you all have a signature, right? It's very unique to you. What I would say to you, what are the signature processes of your organization? What does your warm-up look like? That should be a signature process. How do you do the accountancy? How do you pay your bills for your organization? What does a practice look like? These are signatures that stand the test of time. The content may change underneath, but the way you do it, I should be able to walk onto the ice any time and say, I know that team, just by the way they <laughs> behave. You may be wearing a completely different uniform that I don't recognize, but just by the behavior. So, this aspect is a signature process. Plan, execute, review. Plan, execute, review. Everything you do, plan it, execute it, review it, with the review becoming part of the process to help you plan the next cycle. It's relentless and never ends, okay? And this. Imagine this is your hockey program, this sandcastle. Looks pretty good to me, right? Instantly recognizable, firm base, nice firm sights. Now you may be resting on your laurels because this is the program you've had for the last 10 years. But maybe, and you're very happy and you're, you're pumping yourself up, I've got a great world leading program here. Look at my sandcastle. And yet you turn around, walk 10 yards down the beach and someone else has built a sandcastle like that. Now that's a world leading sandcastle. But of course, the instant you've seen that and the bar has been raised on you, across the other side of the planet, one of your competitors has just done this. And this is the concept of Kaizen, the Japanese principle of continual improvement. So in plan, execute, review, as a leadership behavior, are you sending the message that you are an organization that is all about continual improvement? every area, or are you running the same programs you've done for the last 10 years? And to finish, this is the video I would sit down with all your staff. If you want to learn about excellence, if you want to learn about excellence, watch this little video. Ilo Dreams of Sushi. This is an octogenarian, he's 80 odd years. He has an eight seat sushi restaurant in the Tokyo subway. Eight seats, and yet he has a Michelin star. A Michelin star. Great video on excellence. He's got one guy that's been cooking rice for 10 years. That's all he does. That's his role and responsibility, and he admits that he hasn't got it right yet as he pushes the envelope of excellence. This is a superb video. Very quickly, I'll be done in two. <笑>で、仕方がかわいそうだから早く譲ってあげてって。ずっとまあ、親さんがやっていければそれでいいんですけれども、そうはいかないですから、いつか交代しなきゃいけないですから。そこまで協力までいけば完璧かもわかんないけ
Oh. Oh, yeah, you. So guys, as I said before, because we don't have a panel discussion, we open for questions. Are there any? Oh, over here. You can catch it. This one. Can you see it? Oh. Okay, so I'd uh, like to hear your comment about uh, talking about the execution, the planning execution, and let's say nice okay feedback. What is this reviewing? But in my experience, I would say that we coaches, we are 100% with the players when we do the execution and also when we give the feedback, but there's a hell of a lack of getting the players involved with the planning process. I think that's a terrific comment to make. And so that cyclical diagram I showed, a plan, execute, review. Whilst I do believe that in the end, you know, someone's got to call the shots. So the framework of the plan, you've got to, you've formulated in their mind. But to involve at every stage the key constituent people, your, obviously your staff, your direct coaching staff with you early in the process, and then you must bring the players on, at the very least from the discussion around what the timetables are going to become, what, do you, what things do you do, do first things first as you get ready to do the next thing, so, so you can head off the question, coach, why are we doing this? Well, they, if they understood why you were doing it, you would have less time wasted on the nonsense, right? So getting people involved at a relative stage to the process is vital and what kind of impact they're taking. And the, thing, the key thing I would say is it's a bit like dealing with your novice players. Initially, the novice players, you as the coach, you're the leader bringing them along. But your more advanced players, that, that's the, that relationship has changed quite dramatically and you're involving them much sooner in the process. But the players must be involved overall. They must at least understand the timetable that you're doing and why you're doing certain things. That's why people joke a little bit, a little bit about the difference between coaching females versus males because females are normally much more inquisitive and want to be part of the process than males. But it also comes down to the way in which we've trained the males from an early age. We train them to be a little bit more robotic and that sooner or later that will come back to hurt us as well. So my view is you drive the ship with your staff initially, set the overall framework, but you involve at every level whoever is going to be actually having an, a role and responsibility and get their feedback. And if they can show that they have some kind of ownership to the process, you're way further ahead. So an excellent question as far as I'm concerned. And you're right, we don't involve people till the feedback after the fact, and yet you want to get the buy-in, it's got to happen much sooner. <laughs>